to Take It From The Iron Woman. My name is Susanne Müller, your host and the Iron Woman. This podcast is about empowering yourself and others to make real changes in the world. You will hear from everyday, smart, sophisticated, hip people like you and me. Not everybody has to be an Iron Woman to impress the world. Together, we will learn from the sports and business leaders how you can become a more successful person as an entrepreneur or a leader. It's one step at a time, one day at a time. Take your steps now, take your big steps now. Join me on this journey to success. Hello and welcome. Take it from the Iron Woman. Again, we have Katie with us. Katie is American, but she lives in Argentina. And in our last episode, we learned from her how sometimes difficult it was to be alone in Argentina or during her travels. But now she's a businesswoman. She's the CEO of Katie Watts English Consulting Service. So Katie, introduce yourself a little bit and tell us about your exciting venture that you started a few years ago only. Yeah, so thank you, Suzanne. I'm happy to be back again. Like you said, uh, my name is Katie Watt. I live in Argentina. I've lived in a city called Salta for over eight years now. My academic background is in international affairs and international development. I suppose I started my professional career in a business school in Argentina. And then after a couple of years, I decided to go independent. And I started teaching English, teaching English kind of in quotes because I only worked with adults and I I did a lot more than just giving them classes. So I started working with them. They needed to send emails or communicate with particularly difficult clients or tricky situations just because the way we communicate in the US is so different or from Argentina, you know, each country has its own little nuances. And this year, this past year, it really started to develop. Um, I started working with a younger cohort, high school students and young college students who are trying to study abroad in the U.S. So working with them on, on the whole process, because I think the process is also so different. And, and from Europe, I mean, I've had some come to me to talk about going to Europe, and I don't feel 100% comfortable helping them because I never went through it. But at least to apply to college and to grad school, I had to do it mm -hmm. in the US a little bit, I know, firsthand. So I've really been working through that whole process. And It's a little bit of coaching. It's a little bit of English. It's test prep. So it's a really, and, and it's a year long process really to, to get from zero to accepted. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm doing now. And I really, it really opened up a passion that I didn't know I had. And so I'm really having a lot of fun with it. That's cool. And I remember I had to take the TOEFL test, the test of English as a foreign language. Mm -hmm. And I did it all by myself. And I remember... Oh I had to go somewhere in deep in Brooklyn to take that test and it was, uh, I don't, I'm not really, I don't really have fond memories of that time. Yeah, it's, it's a monster. It is. And it's, it's opening up a lot of things when you want to study in the US. So I'm, I'm wondering, so they high school students and how is their English? Or you teach them a little more then? Unfortunately, in Argentina, the, the levels of education are very disparate. You have private schools that have really excellent levels of English, and then you have public schools that mm -hmm. don't have very good levels of English. So I've, I've worked with young adults with all levels of English, and the TOEFL people probably won't like it that I say this, but you can still take the TOEFL test if you don't have a great level of English. <laughs> So we work a lot on the strategy. We study the format of the exam. Mm -hmm. And of course, the better your level, the better, the easier it is to progress quickly. But I have one of my, one of my favorite students. He's actually going to take it this weekend. So we're crossing our fingers. <laughs> But I mean, he started and he couldn't say, hello, my name is. And now he's, he's able to make the recordings. You know, they're not perfect. But he has made huge leaps in only three months. 
and I don't really teach grammar or anything. It's just implementing and, and we meet twice a week and, and the conversations that we have. And I think it goes to show you that if you're determined, you can do it. And, and I don't think it's me. I didn't teach him any of this. I mean, he really studied and practiced on his own, but I was behind him pushing for sure. Well, it always needs, we always need to have a good coach behind us to, and setting a goal, right? So setting a goal mm -hmm. to take that test uh, early in December, certainly a huge step. And I'm just wondering, like, so then he wants to go to the US to study. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been teaching in a college in New York, and I saw different levels of English of my students. So yeah, and I think that's, it's a flaw in the system, definitely. I don't, I don't think any of the standardized tests are really very fair the SAT, the GRE, the GMAT. And I tell that to all my students, but unfortunately it's a reality of the system that we have. And so we have to do it. Mm -hmm. But I do know the majority of universities, at least sure NYU, Suzanne, and then Ohio State where I went and also the University of Pittsburgh, they have lots of resources for international students. So you can go to the writing center and they help you write your, your papers and your essays. And mm -hmm. so I tell them the first couple of months, yeah, it's going to be really hard, but don't be afraid to ask for help. And, and, you know, you as a professor also, I'm sure if a student comes to you and says, look, I'm really having trouble and they're honest about their struggle, you're, you're even more accommodating, you know, maybe you give them that little bit of extra time. So I always tell them to, to be honest with their professors, to use the resources that they have at the university and to not get discouraged by their English level. But I also have to say that I am mostly super impressed by the student as a, who, whose English is not their first language, how well they're writing because they're studying it, as we know, when you grow up and you learn a language just by listening, it's actually different. And me as a professor, mm -hmm. I always say, if I see mistakes and I don't like those mistakes with it, when it is, it is, or yours, mm -hmm. then I say, if I see those mistakes, I'm sure there's other mistakes too, because people don't pay attention. So I think actually when people study English, because then we memorize it, then you memorize mm -hmm. it correctly. So I think you're doing a great job and helping them a lot. Yeah. And tell us also a little bit about the business people that you work with. What services do you offer to them? So the, the things that I've done with the business people has, has kind of been a little bit ad hoc. So the, everything started off as English classes. They wanted to improve their communication in English. They wanted to talk to somebody who's native. And then these little things started coming up. One of my, one of my oldest and favorite, most favorite students, he, he runs an import-export business in Argentina. Um, and so he has to communicate with people from all over the world. And so Every, every once in a while, he says, you know what, Katie, we're not going to do our typical conversation class today. I have this client and he'll kind of explain the situation to me. And he says, to send an email because I need to get this answer or I need to get this paper signed off. And so, you know, we, we draft the email and he kind of gives me the context and I help him. Hmm. It. I've, I mean, I've even, <laughs> he had a disaster with some plane tickets. And so one day he was like, can you please help me? And we ended up calling Southwest Airlines and we had to rebook a whole bunch of, of, of tickets. And so just things that if you're not a native speaker, you're talking to somebody's customer service line. I know for me in Spanish, that's really stressful because maybe you get someone who's not very patient with you or you get someone who has an accent that's different than yours. And, and so just kind of giving that day-to-day -day support in English that, that different businesses need. And, and it might not be a constant thing, but I've created this environment of trust with my clients slash students, and they can come to me and we can solve those problems. Mm -hmm. And you just said it correctly, right? It's about trust. So they know mm -hmm. that they come to you. And because you moved from the U.S. to Argentina, you know how hard it is. I remember when I moved to the US, the first time I had to pick up the telephone, I started to sweat and I even didn't know how to use the telephone. Like I hit the button and I connected all the time. So they had to show me how to use the telephone. And I pressed the receiver so hard to my ear 
and now you you're on the phone and you think about something else so it comes second nature but the first few weeks are so difficult it's really stressful and and i know for me in argentina to do that in spanish my poor husband i make him make all of those phone calls because i still after eight years i still get stressed out talking to customer service um yeah. it's just you don't have you don't have those visual cues you're thinking about something else and they say one thing and then you miss it and 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 it's, yeah it's a stressful situation it's difficult yeah and talking about mm-hmm. stressful situations i know you're a mom now how do you find the balance between the ceo and the mom and the wife and everything it's an ongoing challenge definitely the first year was a big adjustment um, I knew I always, I always wanted to be a working mom. I think moms who stay at home are superheroes and that was not my goal. So, but it comes with its other baggage, right? Like I feel guilty that I'm going to the office and I'm taking my kids to daycare and balancing. How do you, how do you cook dinner and get home on time and pick everybody up? And you know, I, it, it's a big learning curve. What worked for me was we just got a really good routine and we stick to that routine and we're on vacation right now and we still stick to that routine. You know, my son, he, he knows that after daycare and we come home and we eat dinner and after dinner we take a bath and after bath we read our books and we go to bed. And so even now he's finishing dinner and he'll say, let's take a bath, mommy. And, and so he has it so incorporated, which makes it so helpful now that he's, you know, he's just got the routine down and, and it's not really even a fight, but it's a work in progress. Well, it's all a work in progress. And how do you find some me time? I remember once we had a call, you said, oh, I just came back from Pilates class. So mm-hmm. How do you find your me time and what do you do for yourself? Yeah, it's hard to come by me time as a mom, but I do think it is extremely important and couldn't do any of this without my husband. You know, he's such a companion and everything in our house is 50-50 and been that way day one and that's I wouldn't change that but one thing that we try to do he travels a lot during the week so I'm actually home alone with my son during the week but on the weekends we try to give each other maybe two hours so you know I'll take my son for a walk into the park and he has two hours to go to the gym or just sit and watch tv if he wants to and then we switch off and of course the idea isn't for us to be isolated from our son but to have just a little bit of time where each of us can do something for ourselves and and it actually makes the whole the whole family dynamic a lot more fruitful i think think so yeah 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 and yeah. before we recorded this podcast i asked you what kind of podcast are you listening so tell me again <laughs> well so of course i'm listening to take it from the iron woman huh? but I, I i don't do a lot of podcasting right now since the majority of my repertoire is kids music <laughs> <laughs> but before i had kids i really liked the Freakonomics podcast. Mm-hmm. I just think those guys are great and they do a good job of presenting both sides of the situation and they don't judge. And so they give you the information and, and you decide. And then Stephen Dubner, who's the, who's the host of Freakonomics, he also has a podcast called Tell Me Something I Don't Know. It's hilarious. It's a game show and they just bring people on with these weird facts and whoever has the weirdest fact wins the game show. So <laughs> Uh, it's one of those it's fun to put on while you're cooking or cleaning the house and you just kind of giggle and listen and and maybe learn something but it's a fun one to listen to and I think that's also some downtime for yourself so when you have a busy day you need to have some fun and yeah I think this is this is fantastic but I also like when you say you need to have a routine probably not only for your little King Felipe but also for yourself and that gives you also more freedom and more space to do other things. Yeah, I have friends. I mean, being in Latin America, (laughs) having a routine is really kind of a novel concept. Um, So, you know, our family and our friends are like, oh, Katie's house is so strict and so, you know, we don't want to interrupt their routine. And, And it's actually not. 
uh, on the contrary, like the routine, like you said, gives us the flexibility to do other things. But I think kids especially, but I think us too, having a little bit of structure and for example, on Sunday afternoons, I cook dinner for the whole week and I separate it out into Tupperwares. Mm -hmm. So then when I get home, I don't have to cook. So I get home, my son and I, and sometimes my husband, if he's home, we sit down and we have a nice dinner at the table and we're not throwing together dinner and stressed out and crazy dinner time moment. It's actually a really happy, pleasurable moment that we can have as a family. And so that little bit of preparation on Sunday really makes the rest of the week a happy week. <laughs> Oh, that sounds cool. And it sounds like that maybe people from Argentina are learning from you. So that's a cross-cultural moment. Maybe they get more organized and they also can set up a routine. Who knows? It's yeah. a good yeah. story, right? So organized and you can sit together rather than cutting all the vegetables. And so you right, or ordering takeout. You know, we have a nice home-cooked meal. We try to eat as healthy as possible. And, mm -hmm. and so I know that when I get home, you know, I have all of everything prepared. I just have to pop it in and heat it up. And then I'm not saying, oh, well, let's just swing by whatever takeout place and eating takeout food. So it's the other thing we, it, it keeps our bodies healthy. It keeps our minds healthy. We're not stressed out. And I think that's fantastic. So we got some great insights. It's about the routine. It's about finding the balance. It's about preparing the food for the next week. So you can enjoy when you are hungry and you can sit together as a family. Well, mm -hmm. wonderful. Thank you so much, Katie. And good luck with your English consulting service. Thank you so much. Thank you, Suzanne. How interesting was that to learn about a routine to cook on Sunday evening? What is your routine? Would love to hear. Please leave a comment. We have more episodes coming out on Monday. More cross-cultural episodes. Thank you for listening.